My name is Paul Hitchcock. Really excited for this event today. I have two incredible guests. I've got Harry Barth here, who is the founder and senior managing partner for the asset protection, estate planning, and business planning firm, Barth Calderon, located in Southern California, with clients across the country. Uh, Harry is a top speaker to groups uh, all over the country, apartment associations, business groups, very much in demand for his speaking. So we put out a lot of education, and this is one of them. Uh, also, we have Steve Williams here, who is a partner with Freed Williams and Grice Connor, uh, founder of that firm as well. So uh, welcome, gentlemen. Thank you, Paul. It's good, it's good to be here, Paul. Yeah, and I want to tell everybody, we got a bunch of people coming on. This is great. <laughs> I, we want this to be interactive. Now, Harry's going to give a talk here and give you all the details on it. But we want you to put your questions in the chat and we will address those uh, towards the end, but also maybe as we go along, if they uh, pertain to what Harry's talking about. So there's a lot here. Put your questions in there. Don't be shy. Also, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll make this announcement a couple of times. For anybody that wants to get one on one for a complimentary <laughs> assessment with Harry and the team over this act, your planning, as you see what's going on here. Happy to make that happen. I'm going to put a link up in the chat. If you click on that link, fill out an online form, take you 10 seconds. It's very quick. That'll get you dialed in to getting one-on-one -on -one with the team to answer questions on your own situation. So I'll put that up here in a second. Uh, so with that, I want to introduce Steve here. Steve, if you could just let everybody know who you are and, and what you're focused on, that'd be great. Sure. Thank you. Uh, yeah, my name is Steve Williams. I'm a partner with the firm Freed Williams and Grice Connor, as you can see right there. Uh, and I've been uh, practicing real estate and landlord tenant law since 1999. So we're going on almost 25 years. And, um, you know, uh, a major part of our practice is the landlord tenant area. And there's always uh, concerns and issues that arise with that particular relationship in regards to liability. Uh, you know, owners and landlords frequently asking me, you know, how how can I protect myself? What can I do to prevent or minimize or, or limit potential uh, threats or claims by tenants? And, and you know, things are going to happen. And what you want to do is to make sure you've got adequate uh, yourself, that you're set up adequately to at least minimize your potential exposure to liability. Because no matter how careful and diligent uh, you are, things tend to arise. You can do everything perfectly. Uh, things may uh, occur that uh, create some potential liability for you, the landowner, uh, landlord, or, or property owner. And you know, one of the things you can do, of course, is getting proper insurance, which is these days getting uh, more and more difficult to uh, obtain in California. Uh, but it is still possible to get uh, insurance coverage that will protect the property uh, and you as a landlord. You don't want your typical homeowner fire policy. You want a landlord policy that includes liability coverage for uh, things that include wrongful eviction. Sometimes that can be obtained through the property policy or in combination uh, with an umbrella policy. Uh, that's, that's one line of defense. The other line of defense is where uh, Harry's uh, firm comes in and, and can help you know, help you in this particular uh, situation is, is setting up some sort of an entity uh, that will help protect you in the event of a, of a tenant claim, will help protect your personal assets in the event of a, of a tenant claim. Now, that's creating liabilities such as an LLC or maybe even a corporation in some circumstances. Harry can talk more about that. But that's where today's talk comes into play, which uh, um, apparently, and, and this is you know, still fairly new, and this isn't my area of expertise. This is where Harry's going to enlighten all of us as to how um, the laws are going to be changing when you create those entities, uh, certain things you may have to do in, in the future, uh, coming up probably fairly soon. Uh, but again, creating uh, an entity is, is one particular way to, an additional way to protect your assets. And there's going to be some new um, apparently some reporting requirements. So so with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to Paul or Harry to, to further elaborate on that. Yeah, Harry, you want to jump in? What do we need to know? Okay, so here we go. So we have a lot to talk about today and take good notes. We'll take questions as we get towards the end, but there's a lot to talk about. 
So uh, first, a little bit of a definition, uh, some definitions, because you're going to hear me referring throughout the, the talk this morning to an entity called FinCEN. FinCEN is the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, and it's a department of the Department of Treasury. And it's the FinCEN network that is responsible for the enforcement um, of the Corporate Transparency Act. And we're going to learn today all about the new Corporate Transparency Act. And Steve, it's going to affect almost universally everybody that you're working with uh, significantly. Not only new, but old. And we're going to talk about that. Well, so so the, go ahead. So you mentioned so it's a corporate transparency act. So is that can also impact limited liability companies? Oh, I'm going there. Let me. It's gonna. It the name is really not um, consequential to the dynamics of the act. So uh, let me run through it, and I think everyone will get a really good picture of this. Uh, we'll call it this very, very intrusive and very difficult act. So, so um, it was passed in legisl bipartisan legislation in January uh, of 2021. And I think it's very important for everyone to understand what this was all about. It was born out of 9-11, um, continued with the Patriot Act, and then the Know Your Client and <clears throat> Sarbanes-Oxley. The purpose of the Corporate Transparency Act is to build a registry of who are the humans that own entities um and it's not a public registry it's a it's for governmental and law enforcement use only uh it could be used by the united states government uk they want to know so it's really important as i talk today to understand the goal is who is behind the veil of the llc's limited partnerships corporations limited liability partnerships the goal is to root out terrorist financing, money laundering, uh, tax evasion, and other nefarious activities. It was further enhanced by uh, the Pandora Papers and the Panama Papers uh, and all people hiding behind layers and layers of, of entities. It is targeted exclusively to small businesses and not large businesses, as you'll learn in a few moments. So it does affect the every LLC every limited partnership and every corporation that's not exempt that's ever been in existence in the United States of America. Not only new, but looking backward. That says there are close to 33 million entities that need to register under this act. Now, is the government serious? Well, there are penalties associated uh, with not complying with the act. And we'll talk all about the compliance. Let's get the penalties out of the way because they're not insignificant. For once compliance is required, and we'll talk about those time deadlines, uh, if you're not in, if your entity is not in compliance, it's a five hundred and ninety one dollar a day fine, which is not insignificant. In addition, if it's willfully not in compliance, it's a ten thousand dollar criminal fine and up to two years in prison. So it is a felony not to comply with the Corporate Transparency Act. OK. Given that, as a background, a uh, couple of things that are going on uh, in, in, the, in the judicial world. There is a, the National Small Business Association uh, has a uh, cause of action going against uh, the United States to try to, clear, to declare the Corporate Transparency Act, which took effect January 1st, 2024, unconstitutional. Well, I've been doing this for close to 45 years. Um, I've, read the, I've read the case. Uh, my best guess is that some parts of the Corporate Transparency Act may be declared unconstitutional. They'll become clear as I go through it, but I would say the vast majority of it is here to stay. Why? Most modern Western economies already have a version of the Corporate Transparency Act enacted in their countries, and also in the modern Asian economies have it as well. We can't even get a notary today without a driver's license, a fingerprint, and where the heck we live. So this is very, very similar uh, to that. All right. So dividing line, January 1st, 2024, new entities, pre-January 1st, 2024, existing entities, some timelines. 
So for new entities created after January 1st, 2024, 90 days from the day that the entity is born. So the day the Secretary of State of California or whatever state you live in says, you are good to go. You know, we have your LLC is good to go. You have 90 days to bring that into compliance under the Corporate Transparency Act. For all of the pre-existing entities that exist, all of them that are not exempt, they have to be in compliance by December 31st, 2024. It's going to be how they're going to do that in the next 11, 11, 10 and a half months is kind of beyond me. Uh, There is legislation pending uh, now that's passed the House, but not yet the Senate. And Joe hasn't yet signed it that will extend that pre-existing entity registration to December 31st, 2025, to give us an extra year to come into compliance as far as that's concerned. So talking about compliance, let's talk about how this comes about. And what I'm going to do um, is I'm going to start with a new entity, one that's formed after January 1st, 2024, and then we'll relate back to how it relates to entities that are in existence prior to January 1st, 2024. So we're going to create a new entity. We'll call it Steve Paul Harry Co. LLC. And we formed it uh, at the beginning of February of uh, 2024. And of course, what are we going to sell? We're going to sell widgets. And we have a DBA um, that is... um, widgets are us. So the first thing we have to determine is whether or not that new entity that we formed is exempt or non-exempt from the CTA Act. And there are a number of exemptions. Let me run through them with you. And Harry, this applies to the property in the LLC, of course. Oh, it applies to the the LLC. So whatever's in the LLC, whatever money, a bank account, property, doesn't matter. If you're not exempt, We must comply, and I'll talk about that. It's a complying entity. So who doesn't have to comply? I think that's very important. You'll find that most, Steve, of the clients that you work with and their entities must comply. So let's talk about the exemptions. Large public companies, public companies, if they're listed on the American Stock Exchange, the New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, we know who all the people are. Remember, look for who are the humans behind the veil. They're registered with the SEC. The exchanges have vetted them. We know who they are. They are exempt from filing. This is targeted to small businesses because this is where the nefarious activity has taken place. Registered investment advisors who are regulated by the SEC are exempt from filing. Um, uh, Capital fund advisors, venture capital fund advisors, also regulated by the SEC, are exempt from filing. Insurance companies who are regulated by the state and insurance producers, they're exempt from filing for the CTA because all of their information, their fingerprints, who they are, are already with the government regulatory authority that's associated with it. Highly regulated financial services, banks, credit unions, uh, registered securities brokers and dealers, and trust companies um, are exempt from CTA. Now, just because I didn't mention a trust, the CTA is LLCs, limited partnerships, corporations. Trusts are not part of the Corporate Transparency Act. They don't get registered with the Secretary of State. But you'll learn in a little while that if a trust holds a required uh, a reporting entity, then all the aspects of the trust must be reported as well. So, And I'll get into the details on that. So those are exempt. Public accounting firms that are registered with Sarbanes-Oxley are exempt. Tax exempt uh, nonprofits are exempt. Governmental agencies are exempt. Subsidiaries, wholly owned subsidiaries of exempt companies are exempt. So if the parent is exempt, the wholly owned subsidiary is exempt. Now, let me give you an example of, of that. For, for exam- and then also, let me give you one other before I get to that. And what they also call the large company exemption that may have some impact on, on, on the clients that are with us today. So that is, and this is an and, not an or. If you have 20 full-time employees as determined by state law, full-time, not 1099 contractors, not part-time, 20 full-time, and your office is in the United States of America, 
and you have five million dollars or more of gross sales you are exempt from filing under the cta act all right so but let me give you a, a good example me so i own a law firm as you know steve uh do we have over 20 full-time employees oh yes do we have our office in the united states oh yes are we over five million dollars of gross sales oh yes so barth calderon our law firm is an exempt entity. Freed, Williams, Grice, and Connor, if you don't meet that, you are a reporting entity. However, even though Harry Barth Calderon is not, Harry has 12 companies besides that hold my real estate investments that I've made, my stocks, bonds, and cash, you know, owns a certain equipment, you know, maybe classic cars that we've done for asset protection and estate planning and business transactions all of those 12 that I own are reporting entities, even though, because they're brothers and sisters to me, not parents and children. So that's very important to understand. So almost everybody, uh, even though the main mothership may be exempt, we all have usually multitudes of companies that are not. Remember, this is targeted to the hair salon that has two hairstylists because it's in that hair salon that is two stylists that is a corporation where money laundering activity and terrorist financing takes place. It doesn't happen in big corporations. There's just way too many safeguards that are involved. Okay, so we have Steve, Paul, Harry Co. LLC. We gave birth to that on February uh, 27th. In 2024, let's say that's when California said we are alive. We have 90 days. We don't fall under any of the exemptions. We're going to buy a building together. Uh, we don't fall under any of the exemptions. We have 90 days to bring that into compliance uh, under the Corporate Transparency Act. So the name is a little nondescript. It says Corporate Transparency Act. It's every entity, period. If it has to be registered to, with the Secretary of State, it's an entity that has to require so now that we have an entity that needs to come under the Corporate Transparency Act, let's talk about what we have to do. So first, we have to register the entity itself. And it's the entity, very important, that is responsible for all of the reporting, Steve. Every, so the entity is all the conditions that we're going to talk about. The, re, the responsible party is the entity. So Steve, Paul, Harry Co. needs to report. But what do we need to report? Well, we need to report the name of the company, Steve, Paul, Harry Co., LLC. We also need to report any DBAs. So in our case, Widgets R Us is a DBA. All DBAs must be reported. Then we must put down the actual physical address of our company. Now, it can't be the lawyer's office. It can't be the accountant's office. Matter of fact, uh, what we'll talk about the accountants in a minute, uh, can't be the accountant's office. It can't be a UPS suite. It can't be a post office box. It's the physical address of the company. If the company doesn't have a physical address, then it needs to be the home where the, where, where, where the, where the owners live, need to be reported. And it must include a original government identifying number, which in most cases, guys, is the EIN number, the employee identification number that we got from the IRS. If it's a single member LLC that does not have one, we maybe obtain a number for um, uh, convenience, or we must put down our social security number, all right, for the entity. So the entity must report. So, Harry, yes. A question here, and I think I know the answer. I think this will be a quick one. Uh, a general partnership, uh, is that required to... Well, actually, no, because the general partnership is not registered with the state. So if, since it's not registered with the state, it's not a formal entity. At this time, at this time, the answer is no. But if it's what a general if, what partnership... If it's holding, if, what if it's holding shares of... Then perhaps, yes, we're going to get to that. Mm -hmm. Or if it's a general partnership of two LLCs, then the two LLCs are reporting entities. We're going to get to all those nuances as we as we move through. So let's try to save the questions if we can towards the end, because I think I'm going to answer most of them as we go along. Um, so so we have our we've now set up our reporting entity. Now, very important to understand who and how this should be done. Now, this is not a commercial for lawyers, but uh, you have a couple of things. The, for example, the AICPA has told all the CPAs they should not 
not get involved with helping people with the Corporate Transparency Act, they consider that to be the unauthorized practice of law because we're determining, as you will learn, from the estate plan, the function and the power. You're going to determine from control, function, and power. We're going to talk ownership, function, and power. This really needs to be determined by people that know how to make that determination to be in compliance. And also, I think it's important that people have, because of the criminal penalties that are associated with it, maybe it's a good idea to have some attorney-client privilege as we're trying to figure this thing out. So now we got, Steve, our reporting entity. Now, the next thing we need to report are its beneficial owners. All right. So a beneficial owner is anyone that owns more than 25 percent. That's not a minor. All right. So so we'll get to back to the minors for a second. So in, in Steve, Paul, Harry call, we each own 33 and a third. So we are we have to now report us, the humans, as the beneficial owners to the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. What must we report? So, Steve, you would have to give your name, Steve Williams. We would have to put your physical address of where you live. And we would also have to send a color copy by a PDF electronically of your driver's license unexpired or your passport unexpired to the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. That is the information that Steve has to file, Paul has to file, Harry has to file. Now, to make it a little easier, all right, everyone can go, and, and, and Paul will put this in the chat, to and should go to the FinCEN Financial Crimes Enforcement Network website, uh, FinCEN.gov. And there is an option there, Steve, something you should do, uh, to create an account at FinCEN. And we, we can't do that as lawyers for our clients because they're going to know where you went to high school, where, you know, where you go to elementary school, what was the color of your first dog, you know, two-factor authentication to establish that account. Once that account is established, you can upla upload one time Steve Williams, your address, and your driver's license. Once they have that properly, they will give you a FinCEN identifying number. So now every time that you have to do a CTA disclosure, you would just put Steve Williams, number so-and-so, so-and-so, and so-and-so, and, -so, and your obligation is to make sure that if there is any change to that information that you that you got you sent to FinCEN, you have 30 days to keep that up to date. So if you move, get a different driver's license, whatever it may be, have to have a, a new passport that's updated, we need to keep that up to date with FinCEN. So now we have our uh, three owners, all right, uh, as well as our entity that are now have to go up to the FinCEN. But like I say in infomercials, that's not all. So now we also have to do, which is not clear in the corporate title or beneficial ownership, we must report everyone who has any control over our entity. So let's just say, for example, uh, we formed our LLC in California, Delaware, Nevada, where we formed it. And we hired uh, Jack Black, Inc. to be the manager of our LLC, all right? And Jack Black, Inc. doesn't own a single membership interest or percentage of Steve, Paul, and Harry Cole, but they have control. Now, since they have control at 1% or no percent, Whoever controls our entity must report. So now we have a corporation. What must we report for that corporation? We must report who's the president, who's the CEO, who's the COO, who's the CFO, and all of their information and identifiers for them. If there is a board of directors that is involved with our corporation, and the board of directors has the ability to remove or replace any of the C-suite, you know, the CEO, the COO, then every member of the board of directors also must report to FinCEN. Okay, isn't that lovely? Could be, so now we're up at about maybe 30, 35 uh, reporting on our initial company. So to make matters a, a, a little worse, there's for all entities formed after January 1st, 2024, there are two more reportings called the company applicant. So if Steve, you came to 
uh, my law firm and my paralegal filed the new LLC for you with the state of California, my paralegal must report as a company applicant that she formed Steve, Paul, Harry Co. with her identifying information. In addition, in addition to that, if I am the lawyer that recommended to you to form that LLC, if I am the supervising attorney, I must report as well. So the supervising attorney must report. The actual filer must report. All the beneficial owners must report. The entity must report. And everyone in control must report. Now, if that's not enough, the word, the word continues on. So now, let me give you an example. Uh, I was just doing a seminar the other day for a bunch of uh, CEOs in Texas. And, you know, in Texas, everybody Steve's in the oil and gas business. And they said, okay, let's look at the structure of a drilling of an oil well. So we'll use that as a means of an example for us today, because I think it'll be very, very helpful. So when they drill an oil well, it's usually a singular LLC for asset protection purposes. These things blow out, they catch fires, people are injured. It's, dr it's dangerous drilling oil wells. So they always are done as an individual LLC per oil well. So that becomes a reporting entity. So there we go, that's number one. Now, usually there are investors that invest in that oil well, but no one invests individually. Everybody invests through an LLC. So usually there are four or five investors in the oil well. Each one is an LLC. Every one of those LLCs is a reporting entity. And who owns those are a reporting entity. And who controls those is a reporting entity. Usually those investors are held by a holding company. That holding company and all of its officers and controllers are now reporting entities. And you know, Steve, if you don't want to have your interest um, go to probate uh, or get to your family the right way, you would usually take your LLC interest and have it held in your trust, your family trust. Since your family trust, although it's not a reporting entity, owns 33 and a third percent of Steve Paul Harry Co., we now must report your trust as an owner. Who created the trust? The grantor was the power to move assets in and out. Who are the trustees? They have to report. If we have trust protectors, they have to report. If someone holds a power in a trust to change the direction of assets within a trust, they must report. And in sophisticated trust, you have family trust, intentionally defective grant to trust, dynasty trust, asset protection trust. There are different trustees having different functionality within the trust and the beneficiaries who own over 25% need to report. Now, if we have a minor, under the age of 18 as defined or whatever a minor is under state law, they do not have to report. But the parents of the minor need to report. When the minor reaches age 18, then the minor needs to report. And we need to report that the parents are no longer part of the um, LLC. This is absolutely amazing. And it goes on and on and on. So what happens is on a new entity that we just formed, it's a little easier because when we as attorneys put together, um, you know, the new entity for our building, we know who the owners are. We know if we're going to put it into trust. We know who the manager is going to be. So we know all the different reporting parties so we can create the analysis for what's required to bring our entity into compliance under the Corporate Transparency Act. And then we have a service that's available because nobody wants to sit on the Byzantine FinCEN website to report all of those 30 things. I think we charge 250 bucks to do it. It's real simple to register the, that entity with FinCEN. So those are all the things, my God, that need to be reported for our new entity that just got formed. And we got 90 days to do it. Harry, do you want to talk about privacy now? People are asking. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so again, as far as privacy is concerned, there are a couple things that we need to be concerned about. First, the FinCEN, you know, the registry under the Corporate Transparency Act, is not, I repeat, not a public registry. It is only for the use of law enforcement. And it's one and done, guys. Once we have the Steve Paul Harry Co. registered uh, with, uh, with, under the Corporate Transparency Act, 
We have nothing further to do. It's not an annual filing, but we do have to file changes to the information within 30 days. All right. The thing that the couple things that that are that are are important is that in all of the documentation uh, for the new entities formed and all the documentation, shareholders agreements, operating agreements, limited partnership agreements that are in existence, they need to be modified. All of them need to be modified and a new section come out called Corporate Transparency Act, where the three of us agree because it's the entity that is responsible. So Steve, Paul, Harry Co. is responsible to make sure that Paul, Harry, Steve, or any new members report under the act. All right, And there are significant penalties if we don't. So when we sign our operating agreement, it should say that we will report the following information under the Corporate Transparency Act, or you cannot be a member of Steve, Paul, Harry Co., or you'll be bought out at half book value. There is, we have to enforce that. There are no exceptions. So that brings us uh, for the moment. Um, and the other issue that we're all going to face is we have all this information that's moving around. I have all of Steve, all of your information, where you live, your driver's license that's moving to a law firm and maybe the law firm to FinCEN. Well, we should make sure that all this stuff is encrypted properly. There are already bad actors out there trying to intercept information and use it, you know, terribly and in a bad way. And and so there's you have data privacy and data security concerns in moving all of this around. Now, for every entity that was born, performed and not exempt prior to January first, twenty twenty four, we have until December thirty first, twenty twenty four to register that entity and all of its information with FinCEN. Oh my God. So not only do we have to determine the entity, it's good standing, it's actual names, it's trade names, it's identifying numbers. We now have to look at all of its beneficial owners. All right, so my God, some of that might not be so easy. Some of them may be owned by a trust that was created 30 years ago. There may have been two divorces, three divorces, deaths. The operating agreements or the shareholders agreements are not up to date. Okay, and so we really don't know. Uh, uh, we could, in the divorce, try to get from an ex-spouse or the third ex-spouse from 30 years ago that ownership interest that she may hold or he may hold may be very challenging and difficult to get, and there are no exceptions. Every one of them must go to the Financial uh, Crimes Enforcement Network. So those challenges of ownership, that's a legal determination. The challenges of control. So, for example, you can have an LLC that we formed that's 99% owned by us, third, 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 and 1% owned by all well, non-voting, and 1% owned by someone with a voting control. Right? It happens all the time, 99 to 1. So the three of us have to report because we own a third, a third, a third, but the 1% that is the control interest also must report because they control the entity. They have to report, as I said earlier, even if they don't control the entity. The only thing that does not have to be reported on the pre-existing 33 million entities is who is the attorney who set it up and who is the paralegal who filed it. So even if someone uses legal Zoom, legal Zoom files it, they're going to have to report as well. So <clears throat> this is a very, very, very intrusive act. Now, may I wax uh, poetically for a second, um, or philosophically, I should say, is that the goal of this act is noble. Remember I said in the beginning, who are the human beings behind the entity? If it's a trust, who are the human beings behind the trust? Who is in control? All that determination has to be made. It impacts literally 33 million businesses that are in existence. But it's not 33 million businesses. It's 33 million businesses. And some of those businesses can have 30 or 40 different signatories that are involved. <clears throat> Just the oil well example is an example of that. So maybe there's close to 200 million entries that have to happen before December 3rd, 24, <clears throat> in order to be in compliance with the CTA. This is very, very challenging. So, so uh, one of the things that 
my concern is what what what's the gain? <clears throat> this is part of the constitutionality question. We know we now have a burden on 33 million businesses and over business to be formed. We have a cost more likely than not. The burden is time. It takes time uh, from business owners. Cost because very rare will someone be able to figure it out themselves and what to do or nor should they figure it out themselves. And the actual filing itself is going to take time. So do I think that at the end of the day, if we're burdening 33 million businesses, it's going to stop terrorist financing or money laundering with the bad actors? I don't think so. I think at the end, they'll find a way around it. They'll use artificial intelligence and create artificial people. They'll create artificial entities somehow and file them somewhere, some way. They'll find a way around it. But all of the 33 million legitimate, really good, small family businesses that own a piece of property, an apartment building, a lot of commercial building, everyone. And you know what? The other thing I'm concerned about is, is as you were talking about, Steve, when we got going, it's very important that people have appropriate protective entities. You know, so the liability, the landlord tenant liability is limited or for estate planning purposes to help get discounts for estate tax purposes and to protect their assets. If the CTA disclosure has a chilling effect on that, people may not protect themselves as carefully as they should for fear of disclosure uh, to the government. So that could have a very, very negative effect on the positive side. This gives everybody the opportunity to take inventory to make sure that their operating agreements are up to date, to make sure that their shareholder agreements are up to date, to make sure that their limited partnership agreements are up to date with all appropriate language and to eliminate all the bad players that may be involved in their businesses somehow. You know, you know, Joe Blow has a uh, an interest in the business, but Joe Blow is a bad actor and he's not going to, he or she is not going to give their information well, if they don't give their information willfully, it's a felony. This is not, and, and the fine goes back to our company that's been involved in establishing that. So is it a burden? Yeah. Uh, will it solve the problem? I think it'll help. I don't know if it'll solve the problem, but it's here to stay, it looks like, unless it's declared unconstitutional, which is more likely or not um, that it will not. So so that's the old there's the new. And when you look at it, it's kind of uh, overwhelming, but it's something that it's here. It's the law. Now, the other thing that, that's disturbing to me, is it's such, a, it's such a, a very big law that affects so many people in so many ways, yet the government has kept it almost a secret. Um, and, you know, we don't have full, full page ads in the Wall Street Journal. We don't have TV ads talking about uh, compliance, the way that the word's getting out is through the seminars that you've arranged for, for your clients, such as this. Uh, so people know what they have to do in order to comply. One question we get all the time is when should they comply? Well, for the new entities, we have 90 days from formation. For the existing entities, we have till the end of the year. Some people say, do we wait and see whether or not the government's going to change the rules on filing dates? whether or not the constitutionality is going to come into question, I think it's very challenging because some of these are easy to do. So Steve, if you have one LLC uh, and you are the only member that has a building and you put that in your living revocable trust, it's all Steve Williams, Steve Williams, Steve Williams, Steve Williams, relatively easy filing. We have our oil well scenario of three or four different investors or holding companies in a commercial building, not such an easy filing. So, so, <clears throat> My recommendation is it's better to file and file early. We use getting FinCEN numbers and get it out of the way. <clears throat> if there are changes and modifications, okay, that's great. There's not a lot of harm in filing once we recognize, hopefully, that this will not hit the light of public day. It's for law enforcement purposes only. So with that, uh, Paul, Steve, let's open yeah. it up for some questions for a while and see if we can get some some answers. Yeah. So a couple of things I want to mention is that the, you know, uh, I'll put a link. I already put the link and I'll put it in again if you want to get one on one with Harry and the team for an assessment. But what what you know, we're having a ton of these. We've done a lot of these webinars and what we're seeing coming out of those assessments is people get on with an attorney and it talking about CTA, figuring out, OK, 
you know, are, do you have to get involved with that? Who are the owners and, and how do you get it done? We're helping people file, making sure it's encrypted and safe. There's actually a warning on the FinCEN site right now. I'm looking at it. It's in red saying that people are already stealing the information. We knew that was going to happen. So FinCEN saying, be careful. So we're making sure it's encrypted, but also it's an opportunity for the people that we're helping to get on those calls maybe update the trust, look at what's going on there, to, just to make sure they're organized and everything's tightly pulled together because the issues involved are obviously the CTA, asset protection. If you don't have it in LLC, what are the implications there, probate, and then estate planning. So so that that call is, is great. I encourage you to take advantage of that. Uh, and then also, um, Harry, I wanted to just expand on this. Uh, make sure I read this whole thing and Steve addressed it is under a general partnership, which has multiple trusts holding shares of an apartment building. Do those trusts need to disclose all assets under okay, the trust? So trusts themselves are not reporting entities. They're not, not, not under the current law, a trust because the trust as you know, Steve doesn't have to get filed with the secretary of state is not a reporting entity. If the trust holds an interest in a general partnership, a general partnership does not get filed with the state. You know, they may file a tax return, but it's not a bird of the secretary of state. It is exempt from filing. It does not have to file under the Corporate Transparency Act. LLCs, limited partnerships, limited liability partnerships, corporations. doesn't matter if they're S corporations, C corporations, corporations, if they're not exempt. All right. So if you have a corporation that owns a building, all right, and we don't have over 20 employees and over $5 million worth of rents, it's a filing entity. Law firms, medical practices, everything needs to file under CTA. And significant penalties if we do not. Okay, questions? Yeah, uh, if, yeah. please, I'll encourage everyone to type your questions in there. And Harry and Steve, maybe you can expand, you know, chime in on this too. But uh, so I, I live in Marin County. I'm a Northern California guy, and we're members of, uh, San Francisco Apartment Association, East Bay Rental Housing Association. We see a lot of property owners, a lot of them as clients. Um, and a lot of times, Harry, there's multiple owners of those properties. They, you know, around the Bay Area, they've been in the family for generations. Uh, some are passing to the next generation of kids. Uh, but so, so that, so if that's the case and they have it in their trust, I mean, that is a ripe situation for making sure you're on top of it. Correct. So if they have an LLC or a limited partnership uh, that holds the building or a corporation that holds the building or the real estate or whatever else, or even a business, uh, and they own more than 25% of it or they're in control of it, it must report. All right. And then all the owners need to report. Now, it may have, you can have a scenario that you have a limited partnership, Steve, that no one owns more than 10%. You got 10 owners, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. All right. But the general partner who's in control must report at whatever that structure is because they're the controlling entity. But the family attribution rules also come to play. So if you've got a husband and wife at 15 and 15 and the California, that's 30. They have to report. Um, we have minor children uh, that gets aggregated and needs to report. The parents have to report on behalf of the minor children. And of course, you have minor children. What if it's a dissolved marriage? All right. So now you have the husband and the estranged wife or the wife and the estranged husband need to get together to gather the information for CTA, which sometimes there emotionally may be uh, problematic. Right? She or he may not tell them where they want to live, may not want to divulge that information. That's why I strongly suggest that they get a FinCEN identifying number. Then if I have to, if you, Steve, if you got to give me information for you, for your entities, if I'm filing a CTA for your law firm, it's just Steve Williams and there's your number. We don't need to get all, you've got, you've taken care of that with FinCEN. I would strongly suggest to everybody listening that they get those FinCEN numbers and then give them to the people that are going to help them. Steve, any comments from you as we look to wrap this up here? Well, I was just, um, I think Harry kind of answered it there, but I, I was just uh, wondering. So you mentioned each individual gets their own number, but the actual, that's separate from the actual reporting of the entity. The entity reports yes. directly to FinCEN, and then each member or each owner, qualifying owner, gets their own identification number. Correct. That then is, is somehow associated with that entity. So as they update. No, it's not associated with the entity. Okay. It's, it's just 
if if you are a beneficial owner in our in our if, you know Steve Paul Harry Coke we each have FinCEN numbers, and so Steve Paul Harry Co is an entity that's reported and it's ID number, and then the three owners are Steve Williams number so and so and so and so Paul so and so so and so Harry number so and so so and so, and if the three of us are the managers of the LLC, the three of us report again the same name and number along the way. So by doing that. Uh, that's very, very helpful. And then if we are, if the if if your one third share is in yours and your spouse's living revocable trust where it belongs for estate planning purposes, then and you guys are the trustees, so you're the trustees of the trust, but it's just Steve and you have your number, wife, and she has her number. The creators of the trust for you and your wife, the same number along the way. So by using that, we don't we don't have to uh disclose every single time our address with you can do that privately with Finson. Uh, got it. Okay. Any other questions here? Anybody else? Harry, I think you do such a great job there breaking it down. Uh, uh, you answer a lot of questions as we go along. So I do want to tell people we will send out the replay to everybody that uh, signed up and attended here. So look for that over the next few days. And I want to thank, uh, yep, both of you, Harry and Steve. Thanks for thanks for doing this. Uh, good to see you, Steve. Good yeah. to see you, Paul. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully, this is very helpful for everybody. Take care, guys. Thank you right. so so much. Right. Bye bye. Bye. bye.